Okay, so I think we are live. Um, so, hello everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Um, so by now, hopefully this procedure is pretty familiar, so I'm not going to talk for too long. But um, just in case we have any new viewers, um, we are very happy to welcome Dr. Kay Brandner from University of Nottingham, who's going to talk um, uninterrupted for the next uh, sort of 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and then I will be moderating kind of questions um, at the end of the talk. So as always, if you think of any questions, um, please do write them in the YouTube chat window. Um, and I will um, kind of relay them to, to Kay and, and, and we have a question and answer session at the end of the talk. Um, so, I mean, before we get on to science, uh, I hope everyone is kind of doing well. Um, and sort of it's an interesting time as we sort of come out of lockdown in many places across Europe. So uh, my fingers are crossed that um, we can kind of get out of this crisis in a, in a sensible way um, in not too long a time scale. Let's see what happens. Um, on another note, it's kind of very heartening to see the very large number of um, similar initiatives, sort of online scientific seminars that have sprung up. Um, and I've seen that recently there's been um, a kind of website put up called researchseminars.org, which kind of amalgamates all of these different um, seminars. So I'll send a notification around um, about this to the, to, the, to the mailing list fairly soon. Um, but I think it's kind of heartening that, that people are finding these technological solutions to, to kind of keep scientific communication going in these times. Um, all right, so let's get on to the science. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Kay Brandner, uh, who's a lecturer at the University of Nottingham, uh, who is an expert in kind of all aspects of quantum thermodynamics, quantum heat engines, uh, quantum transport, and he'll be telling us today about the thermodynamic geometry of microscopic heat engines. So please go ahead, Kay. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for the kind introduction and also for setting up this great series and giving me an opportunity to speak here. It's really a pleasure to be with you. And yeah, today I want to talk a little bit about some work that has been published quite recently and was actually performed before I came to Nottingham uh, at Keio University together with my long term collaborator Keiji Saito. Um, so that's why you see the logos of both Nottingham and Keio on this um, starting slide. Okay, here we go. Um, so I would like to briefly go back uh, to the history of microscopic heat engines um, and explain a little bit where this notion comes from and why are we looking at these kind of systems. Okay. So when we think about heat engines, then typically people have in mind machines like the one showing here. This is a steam locomotive from the beginning of the 20th century. Um, this is a Finnish model, actually, from 1916. And uh, these heat engines work in a relatively simple way, which is illustrated schematically below the picture. So essentially what you need to build a macroscopic heat engine is some working fluid, usually a gas, uh, a chamber where you can find the fluid and a movable piston. And now you go through a so-called thermodynamic cycle, which can take many different forms. And what you see here is an illustration of a Stirling cycle. So what happens here is um, you couple your gas to a hot reservoir and in this way you create a pretty large pressure inside the chamber and then you expand the piston and in this way you extract mechanical work. That's the first stroke. Then you decouple from the hot reservoir, couple to a cold reservoir um, and cool down the working fluid and in this way you reduce the pressure. That's the second stroke and because the pressure is now lower than before, you can compress the gas again in the third stroke um, with less work than you extracted in the first stroke. So that's the reason why we gain a net uh, work output in this process. And then to reinitiate the cycle, you have to heat up the gas again, and that's where you pay the price for the whole process. In the last stroke, you inject heat from the hot reservoir. Okay. So that's basically the, the thermodynamic picture of a macroscopic heat engine. Now, in let's say over the last decade, 
uh, ideas were developed in, in many facets to realize such engine cycles with microscopic objects. Um, and what you see here in, in the top panel on the right is uh, a part of an operation cycle of a microscopic heat engine which uses, uh, instead of some microscopic fluid, nuclear spins um, as their working system. This is an actual experiment which was performed quite recently. Um, I will show the, the, the reference on the next slide. What you see below um, this figure is an illustration of how you can imagine um, this engine works. So it is a pretty similar process. Um, you have a spin one half system in a magnetic field and you first prepare the system in a relatively cold state so that the, the spin is more or less in its ground state that means aligned with the magnetic field. And then you increase the intensity uh, of the magnetic field and you can think about um, this process as bringing closer together two uh, rock magnets that create the field. And in this way, you actually extract mechanical work you know, because the, the magnets are um, attracting each other. You extract work in the moment that you could we, um, move them closer together. Okay, um, then you heat up the system using an external heat source that does not necessarily have to be a, a separate reservoir. Um, it can be any sort of... Um, of artificial heat source even. I will talk about that uh, a little more later. So by heating up the system um, you drive it away from the ground state and it starts to fluctuate more um, around its equilibrium value and also uh, the probability that the spin is aligned with the magnetic field decreases. So you get a more hori horizontal orientation of the spin. And because of this, you can now pull the magnets apart again. That means lowering the strength of the magnetic field um, at a little smaller energetic cost than the gain that you generated in the first stroke. So it's essentially the same principle. Um, and then you reinitiate the cycle uh, by cooling down the, the system again. So that's the idea. Uh, behind this spin engine, which I will use as a paradigm for a microscopic heat engine throughout this talk. Okay, um, yeah, let's go a bit uh, back in history. So this elementary operation principle, yeah, essentially what you need uh, to build a heat engine, even on a microscopic scale, is a heat source and the working fluid from which you can extract mechanical work um, in whatever way. And one of the first realizations of such a microheat engine was uh, 2011, the lab of Clemens Bechinger in Stuttgart with uh, colloidal particles. So the working system here is really on the, on the order of micrometers and you use an optical trap to confine it and the heat source is simply an additional laser uh, which uh, increases the temperature of the water that surrounds the particle locally. And then you can open and close this trap and um, change the temperature of the environment and this way you can build um, a heat engine with colloidal particle. Now a second experiment from 2016, that's the, the next panel, um, was a similar, similar setup but now with a single atom. Um, the cycle, I mean, okay, I shouldn't say the, the setup. The cycle was similar, but the setup is, of course, quite different. You have a uh, single atom here in a tapered pole trap, and the heat source is uh, effectively a stochastic uh, electromagnetic field, or an electric field that you apply to the system uh, with some white noise, which mimics uh, a reservoir at finite temperature. And the work in this system is extracted by exciting uh, longitudinal oscillations of the atom. So here the work does, is not, does essentially go into a separate degree of freedom of the system and it's not lost to 
the light field as it is in the colloidal particle experiment. Okay, and then we have 2019, the last column here. Um, this is the, the spin experiment that I was just explaining. So you have now um, an, an engine cycle realized with a nuclear magnetic spin, which means a working system that is so small, if you want, that it doesn't even have any physical dimension anymore. Okay, I should say that there were many experiments over the last decade with, with microscopic heat engines, even in the quantum regime, and I just picked three of them here, and uh, my apologies to all of those who have not been mentioned at this point. Okay, um, so that's basically three representatives, and now let's compare the, the thermodynamic figures of merit. So what you see, of course, that's not a big surprise. As you decrease the size of the system, the power goes down rapidly. I mean, for a macroscopic heat engine, you would expect something in the, in the order of thousands of watts, which is a couple of horsepowers. And for these micro heat engines and pico heat engines, you have powers uh, in the orders of zectowatts. Um, and I should also say that the, the energy scale of the working system, the single atom engine, is of course much smaller than in the colloidal particle engine, but the, the cycle is run much faster. That's why you get nearly the same power output. Okay, now if you, if you go the, down to, to the spin engine, the power is of course much lower. Interestingly, if you compare now the efficiencies, which are shown here, um, as a bare percentage number and in comparison with the Carnot value, um, these efficiencies can be quite high even um, in, the microscopic, in the microscopic regime. Yeah? If you look, for example, at the, at the um, colloidal particle engine, the micro engine, you see that um, the efficiency is almost 90% of the Carnot value, which is three times better than a microscopic heat engine. Or I should say, a uh, steam engine here at this point. Okay, uh, now what's interesting, I mean, this is the, the, the thermodynamic figures of merit, but it would be interesting to see um, how quantum uh, these engines actually are. And that's, of course, a huge debate, and pinning down quantum effects is not easy, and it's even harder to condense quantum effects into a single numerical number, but nevertheless, I want to try here. So I have um, found or introduced this quantum parameter nu here, which is h bar um, divided by Boltzmann's constant times the, the base temperature of the system, which would correspond to the temperature of the cold reservoir. And the tor in this expression is the typical evolution time scale of the system. This is not the cycle time. This is the time scale on which the state of the system changes significantly. Okay? And now, I mean, you can estimate these parameters. Of course, all of that are, are more or less estimates here, but I mean, just to give you an idea of, of how that would look like, you see that this parameter is terribly small for macroscopic and micro engines. And if you go to the level of single atoms, it already becomes larger, but it's still at 10 to the minus 4. And the idea would be that this parameter needs to be in the range of, uh, of 1 to, to see quantum effects. Um, and what you see in the last, in the last column for the, for the spin engine, you have indeed this situation um, that you're approaching this order 1. Now, all of that is, as I said, just a rough estimate to um, kind of support this idea that the experiments of microscopic heat engines are now really approaching the quantum limit. Um, and there are also other experiments, again, um, that show that quite clearly. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a whole debate behind it. This is just to give you a rough idea. Okay, so much for now. Why are we doing that? Yeah, so why are we... Or, I mean, why are scientists in general reducing the size of, of heat engines? Why are people building microscopic heat engines? And there are certainly many reasons for that, and uh, I see personally three 
Um, primary reasons, which I also want to discuss a bit more in the rest of this talk. And these reasons are given here in the slide. So the first thing is um, microscopic heat engines can be described from first principles. If you have a colloidal particle, you can write a stochastic equation of motion for this system. If, and you can solve it and work with that. And if you have a macroscopic fluid, you can never solve the Newtonian equations of motion for the particles in this fluid. So in this sense, you have um, a much better access to the microdynamics of the system. And this might allow us to uh, identify fundamental constraints and thermodynamic figures of merit. In particular, figures of merit other than efficiency. Now, efficiency is universally bounded by the second law. But um, a benchmark like power output, for example, cannot be bounded within classical thermodynamics. And we need, um, we need in a sense, deeper theory, um, or let's say a dynamical theory, to, to access these parameters. So fundamental limits is, is, uh, is one objective here, in my understanding. The second uh, key point that is important, in my opinion, is microengineering. How can we develop uh, optimal design and control strategies? Yeah? <clears throat> if you think about a heat engine, you usually have, have many different parameters to optimize its performance. Um, and these problems can be terribly complex. And now if you have a microscopic system with only a few degrees of freedom, um, you have much better chances to find, let's say, the optimal protocol according to which um, a laser trap needs to be changed in order to create the maximum power output, for example. So optimal control strategies is the, the second main objective here. And the third thing, of course, are quantum effects. Yeah. Um, that's why I was trying to, to emphasize that the experiments are now coming really close to, to the quantum world. And the question would be is, can we describe how quantum effects, or coherence or entanglement, affect the performance of heat engines? And can we exploit them to improve the performance, efficiency and power and so on? And yeah, of course, all of these, um, these questions are quite complex and there are many debates in this field about these problems and others and I'm not going to resolve them today um, but I want to give you an idea um, how we could approach such problems. Okay, so let's move on. Um, I want to briefly review the classical thermodynamics of macroscopic heat engines uh, before I go to the microscopic level. Okay, so this is the standard theory essentially in a single slide of a macroscopic heat engine. You have the Stirling cycle that I explained on the initial slide and you have basically two figures of merit here. One is the efficiency, that's the total work output divided by the heat uptake from the hot reservoir. It's called thermal efficiency, and it is universally bounded by the Carnot factor, which is one minus the temperature of the cold reservoir divided by the temperature of the hot reservoir. Um, in a sense, this is a trivial consequence of the first and the second law. But it's super universal. Um, and then the second figure of merit, which is obvious, is power. Um, of course, I mean, an engine, heat engine doesn't help you in practice uh, if it's super efficient, but it's operated in such a slow way that you essentially generate no power. Yeah, You want to have finite power, you want to get something done. And this is a, a figure that uh, classical thermodynamics says nothing about, because classical thermodynamics doesn't have any fundamental time scales. Um, that means you cannot you cannot really talk about quantities that involve a time scale. Okay, a bit more detailed picture is shown on the right. These are the, the classical thermodynamic cycle diagrams. Um, the most common one is the pressure volume diagram, which you see on top for a Stirling cycle. 
So this is the pressure and the volume of the working system. And these four lines here correspond to the um, four strokes that I tried to explain before. You have two isothermal and two isochoric ones. Um, you extract work when you expand and you pick up heat when you heat up the fluid in the last stroke. And the area that is encircled by this, um, by this line is a measure for the work output of the engine. Now in the, in the lower panel you see uh, a second common diagram, which is temperature versus entropy. Temperature and entropy of the working system, of course. And again, now I mean this, because it's now a different representation, the strokes look a little bit different, but it's exactly the same cycle. And the area that is encircled by, by this line here um, corresponds to some quantity u, which is always larger than the, the output work by the second law. And in the reversible limit where you operate at Carnot efficiency, um, these areas are identical. So then the work and the, the area that is encircled in the temperature entropy diagram are identical. Okay. So that's just a, a brief reminder. Now, this theory cannot be um, translated to microscopic or transferred to microscopic heat engines one to one. The first problem is that for a microscopic heat engine, you usually have, at least in the, in the thermodynamic standard model, well-defined strokes. The microscopic heat engine, the concept of strokes, um, is not, let's say it's not so binding as it is in the, in the macroscopic case. Because in principle, you can apply any driving protocol. There's um, no reason why we should, in this example here, change the position of the magnet in two separate steps. We can do that continuously in, in whatever way we like. And usually because you get your heat input from a heat source and not from a separate reservoir, yeah, heat source like a laser that, that you can tune. Um, there's also no reason why we should fix to um, a setup where we just have two different temperatures. But the temperature can be changed continuously in principle. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I mean, this, this bigger freedom that you have here um, in control also makes it a bit more complicated to describe the thermodynamics of the system. Um, in particular, and that's the, the third point here in this list, it's not really clear how we should define um, the efficiency of an engine that's driven by continuous temperature variations. Because you don't really have a notion of a hot reservoir anymore, you cannot really talk about the heat uptake from a hot reservoir. So one has to find a different measure for the input. And there are different approaches to, for that, and I will talk about one later. Um, and another important point here is that in macroscopic thermodynamics, you usually assume that the working system is on equilibrium. Otherwise, you cannot associate it with proper temperature or pressure. Uh, but that's not the case for microscopic heat engines, usually. First of all, the system is microscopic, uh, so um, it can only be in equilibrium if it's in contact with some reservoir, which is usually the case. Um, but even so, the, the cycles are operated in a finite time, and the working system is usually in this non-equilibrium periodic state. That's what this acronym here stands for. I mean, it means if you run the cycle many times, the uh, state of the system will be periodic, but that's essentially all you know about it. Uh, so one has to have a non-equilibrium theory to describe this kind of devices. Okay. Um, so after this introduction, I now want to go a little bit uh, into the work that we've actually done, and I want to explain a little bit how we have approached these problems. Okay, so let's consider a setup. So we have a microscopic heat engine. We might have in mind the spin engine from the beginning, and we have three basic components. We have a working system, which is described by some state rho. Um, the working system has some Hamiltonian, and the Hamiltonian depends on some control parameter V. 
uh, which can be anything. For example, here in this sketch, it could be the position of the two magnets. And then you have a heat source that you can tune externally such that you can create a time-dependent temperature. And uh, for notational convenience, I want to put the two control parameters, which is the temperature and the control parameter V, together in one vector lambda, and I will um, denote these variables with lambda U and lambda W. So now we apply a driving protocol to this um, system, which means we um, change the, the vector lambda in a periodic manner such that this, um, this vector encircles a closed area, a closed curve gamma in the parameter space. I will show a sketch in a minute. Okay, so that's the basic setup, and now it makes sense, uh, or at least I hope that I can can convince you that it makes sense to introduce um, a set of generalized forces. The first one is just the von Neumann entropy of the system, which will play the role of the entropy in this formalism. And the second one is the generalized pressure. So this is yeah, just the expectation value of the derivative of the Hamiltonian by the control parameter. Okay. Now, once um, you have introduced these variables, you can draw generalized pressure volume and temperature entropy diagrams. And what you have here in the first diagram, you have the generalized pressure, which is defined as on the left-hand side, versus um, the control parameter lambda w, which now plays the role of the volume. And as you see, you can get any sort of cycle, which does not necessarily have the structure of separate strokes, but the enclosed area still corresponds to the generated work. And then the second diagram is the analog of the temperature entropy diagram. So the entropy has now been replaced with the von Neumann entropy of the working system, and the, the temperature is now the temperature of the environment. Because the system is microscopic, so it doesn't have a temperature itself, um, but the environment does. Okay. And now once you have uh, drawn these, these little sketches, you can define the output that's straightforward. It's the work, which is, as I said, uh, identical with the area enclosed in the first diagram. And you can define a generalized input, um, which you could interpret as the uh, heat injection for or the, well, the, should be careful about that the effective heat uptake from the external heat source. And this is the area U that is encircled in the second diagram. It vanishes if the temperature is constant. This is obvious because lambda U is the temperature and you have the time derivative of lambda U entering in this definition. And the second reason why I believe this is a good identification of the effective input is that the corresponding efficiency W over U um, is bounded by 1, and this is a direct consequence of the second law. It does not depend on the specific type of dynamics, and it's valid far from equilibrium. Um, yeah, as I said, it follows directly from the second law. Um, if you now apply a two-temperature protocol, where you could think about two separate reservoirs, one providing heat input, the other one picking up waste heat, then this figure eta is bounded from above by the conventional thermal efficiency divided by the Carnot factor. And this inequality becomes an identity in the quasi-static limit. Okay, so that's the idea. So this, we will use this generalized efficiency from here onwards. And I hope I can convince you that this is um, a reasonable way to define efficiency under continuous temperature variations. Okay, now once we have accepted these definitions, let's see how they play out in the quasi-static limit. Well, if we change the control parameters, so the V and the, the temperature of the environment, extremely slowly, then the system is constantly in an equilibrium state, uh, which is described here by this uh, Boltzmann or Gibbs-Boltzmann state. A curly F is the free energy, um, and under this condition, the thermodynamic or the generalized forces that I defined before 
are just the negative derivatives of the free energy by the control parameters. The efficiency of the cycle is provided you have chosen, chosen proper um, protocols that lead to positive work output, um, the efficiency is one, which would mean for a two temperature protocol, the uh, efficiency is identical to the Carnot efficiency. But of course the power is zero, um, because in order to realize that the system is constantly in the Gibbs state, you have to have uh, an infinitely, uh, infinitely long period. Okay, so that's all consistent, but also pretty unspectacular. So let's take one step away from equilibrium and go to uh, what I call here adiabatic response. An adiabatic response means that we now expand the um, generalized forces in the driving rates, so in the time derivatives of the control parameters um, to first order. And yeah, what you see, I mean, this is just the Taylor expansion to first order, and it defines the adiabatic response regime at the coefficients r that you get your generalized kinetic coefficients. And up to second order corrections in um, the rates, the power is now the geometric work divided by the total period, and the efficiency can be expressed um, in terms of the quantity that is called the dissipated availability. And these quantities are defined below. Um, so the geometric work um, got its name because um, it can be interpreted in a geometric manner. It is the cycle integral of a thermodynamic vector potential in the parameter space along um, the control path gamma. So that's what this first line says. And the thermodynamic vector the potential is defined as, as you see on the right. Anticipated availability um, is given in the last line here. It is larger than zero by the second law. And the coefficients g mu nu that you see here can be interpreted as a metric in the parameter space. There is, oh well, there the negative um, symmetric part of the adiabatic response coefficients um, that describe the relation between generalized forces and uh, driving rates. And you can see that this matrix G is positive semi-definite essentially as a consequence of the second law. Okay, now this um, formalism has three bigger benefits, I would say. And the first one is that you have now a universal bound. Um, the quantity A itself is not geometric in the sense that it depends on the parameterization of the control path gamma. But you can bound it um, from below by a quantity which is called the thermodynamic length and is defined here in the second last line. And this is indeed geometric. It is in fact, nothing but the actual length of your control path gamma with respect to this metric G. And this the, um, divide, provides a lower bound on the dissipated availability together with um, the time that you take to go through one cycle. This is the curly T here. And this bound gives you a trade-off relation between power and efficiency. And that's the the last line here. So what you see is the generalized efficiency can become one only at the price of zero power. That's, I mean, what we expected beforehand, but here you now have um, a quantitative formulation of the statement. Essentially, as you approach the efficiency one, the power has to go down linearly and the slope of this decay is determined by geometric quantities, the geometric work and the thermodynamic length. This is quite cute result, I would say. Okay, second big advantage of this, of course, um, you have an optimization principle, essentially for free. Um, so the, the inequality between dissipated availability A and the thermodynamic length can always be saturated by choosing the parameterization of your control path in an optimal manner. 
And that means you replace the, the time t by some speed function phi of t, which is implicitly defined by the integral in the, the second expression here. When you do that, um, the, the inequality between a and curly L becomes an equality. That also means that the trade-off relation between power and efficiency is saturated, and your optimal efficiency is now um, given just in terms of geometric quantities, thermodynamic length, the geometric work, and um, the cycle time curly T. Okay, now the third point, of course, um, all of that gives you a nice graphical interpretation of the whole formalism. So what you see on the left is um, the cycle gamma, which is down here for simplicity, just chosen as a circle. In the parameter space, the gray arrows in the background show the thermodynamic vector potential. And if you integrate this vector potential along the circle, um, you get the geometric work double. And in a similar way, you can visualize the thermodynamic length by thinking about a distorted coordinate system in your parameter space, which is now yeah, described by this curvilinear coordinates, lambda prime u and lambda prime w. And uh, if these coordinates are chosen properly, they lead to an effective metric in this parameter space, which is identical um, to the thermodynamic metric G. That means your actual curve gamma is now distorted, and the length of this distorted curve is the thermodynamic length, which is a lower bound on the dissipation. So that's quite nice, I think. I mean, I should say that all of these, these concepts have been considered before and they have a long history. Marty has talked about that uh, a lot. And the concept of thermodynamic length has a long history on its own. And I have just applied it here to these microscopic engine cycles. Okay, um, now the last part of this talk, I want to explain a little bit how we can investigate the role of quantum effects in this microscopic engine cycles. Now, how do quantum effects enter here? Well, uh, you can think about, if you think again about our spin engine from the beginning, now I described the cycle essentially as a series of um, compressions and expansions where you basically move the two magnets in a vertical manner. But you could also rotate the two magnets, and this would lead to um, states in, in the working system that contain coherent superpositions between two different energy eigenstates. And that's a quantum effect, I mean, because uh, coherence doesn't make any sense in the classical, classical world. Um, and to describe this, or the impact of this effect on the thermodynamics of the cycle, um, we have to be a bit more specific and we have to specify the dynamics of the working system. That's what I want to do now. Now, these equations look um, pretty horrible, but it's actually not so bad. So what we do, um, the first line under dynamical model, um, we assume that the, the state of the working system follows a usual Markovian master equation so this is just the usual Lindblad generator. It means we assume that the relaxation time of the reservoir is short. We also assume that the coupling between the system and the reservoir is weak and that the driving is much slower than the relaxation time of the reservoir, which makes sense because we're interested in the adiabatic response regime, which is just um, one step away, if you like, in, in driving speed from the quasi-static limit. And now we require um, the conditions one to three from um, the Lindblad generator. Well, let me briefly explain what that means. The first one, um, so that the L dagger is the adjoint of the Lindblad um, generator with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt scalar product. So essentially, that's the Lindblad generator in the Heisenberg picture. And this first condition means that 
the jump operators J induce jumps between the instantaneous energy eigenstates of um, the working system. And this assumption makes sense indeed only if the driving is slow compared to um, the relaxation time, also very slow compared to the relaxation time of the reservoir. Second condition is detailed balance. It looks a bit cryptic here uh, because I've written that with the uh, time reversal operator capital T here. Um, but this is really just detailed balance. And it follows from time reversal symmetry. Um, and the third condition um, says that the set of Lindblad operators is irreducible, which means any operator X that commutes with all Lindblad operators uh, must be a scalar multiple of the identity. That means irreducibility. And together with the condition 2, this condition implies that the system approaches a unique periodic state. Um, now you can think about that um, as follows the system so the the jump up to operators have to make it possible that you reach every energy eigenstate from any other energy eigenstate through a finite number of jumps in both directions forward and backward that's essentially the picture behind this condition and um, it implies as I said that you get a unique limit cycle but I should also say um, that this statement is by no means trivial um, and it has been proven quite recently by Paul Menzel who was a PhD student in uh, my former group in Helsinki um, and it was indeed not easy to arrive there although the condition makes uh, good sense and it is uh, in my opinion quite transparent it's not so easy to establish that on a rigorous um, level I should also say that all of this is true only for finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. Okay, uh, so that's the little excursion about the dynamical model that we're using. Um, and now you can, but you, so the, this dynamical model is in principle on a technical level, this is valid arbitrary far from equilibrium, um, provided always that the conditions um, that lead to these Lindblad dynamics are satisfied. So you have weak coupling, um, fast relaxation and so on. But, um, I mean, solving this Lindblad equation for general driving protocols can be tremendously difficult, uh, in particular when your system is more complex than a two-level system. But we don't have to do that, uh, fortunately, because we're only looking at the adiabatic response regime. Uh, and then you can derive a general solution with adiabatic perturbation theory, which is very nicely um, explained in this paper by Kavina and co-workers here. And if you do that, um, you get an explicit expression for the adiabatic response coefficients r. And this is quite nice because it looks so much like a green kuber relation. So these angular double brackets in this expression indeed um, mean nothing but the standard green kuber correlation function at instantaneous equilibrium. And uh, what you see here is that your response coefficients, like the conventional Onsager coefficients of linear irreversible thermodynamics, are given as um, a correlation function uh, between two operators, force operators Fw and Fu, which are defined below, um, in the instantaneous equilibrium, so at fixed um, control parameters lambda. And from this expression, together with the detailed balance condition 2, you can easily show that the um, response coefficients are also symmetric, provided you have no magnetic fields. And that's the, the adiabatic analog, if you like, of the, of the conventional onsager casimir relation. Okay, now what can we do with that? Um, we need one more technical ingredient and this is um, the last line above quantum friction. So we now divide the force operator for the mechanical force, which is just the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to our control parameter, into two um, parts. 
So the F diagonal is the diagonal part. So this is the part that commutes um, with the, the Hamiltonian. And then you have the second contribution, which I call FC for coherent. And you can write it nicely in this form of a commutator between um, the Hamiltonian and the variable G, um, which is also known as adiabatic gauge potential. Important message here is the FD is diagonal in the energy eigenstates for fixed lambda, and the FC contains all contributions to the FW that are not diagonal um, in the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Okay. Once you've done that, uh, you can now insert this expression into um, the expression for the adiabatic response coefficients. Um, and you see that the, I mean, now you use the invariance condition um, one from before. And then you see that these coefficients nicely decay into a part that depends only on the diagonal force operator and another one that depends only on the coherent one. And this decomposition uh, induces a decomposition of the thermodynamic length, or better to say a lower bound on the thermodynamic length. And that's what you um, see in this little box. So you have a diagonal part of the thermodynamic length and the coherent part. The coherent part now plays the role of um, the quantum contribution because in, in this picture, yeah, a classical limit corresponds to a limit where you have a system with a number of energy levels, but no coherence between them. So all that comes from coherence is, is considered the quantum effect here. And the diagonal, um, well, the um, diagonal part of the density matrix is the classical part, if you like. Okay, so you have this bound, uh, and this induces then a bound on the optimal efficiency. That's the efficiency that you get if you have optimized your driving speed as before. And you see um, the quantum effects in this picture only make it worse. So the slope at which um, the efficiency approaches one in the quasi-static limit as t goes to infinity um, becomes um, steeper um, as the LC decreases, that means you get there um, faster, well, let's see, yeah, if you have less um, coherence in your system. In other words, uh, the coherence generates additional dissipation, and this reduces the efficiency at fixed, so the power at fixed efficiency. That's the correct statement. Okay. And as I said, the semi-classical limit, the LC is zero if and only if um, the Hamiltonian commutes for a given parameter V, commutes with the Hamiltonian at any other parameter value V prime that lies on your control path gamma. That, and in this case, uh, the system is quasi-classical because the density matrix is always diagonal um, and you don't have to, to worry about coherences. Okay, so much for that. Now, to conclude that, I want to briefly show an example. So now we do the, the actual maths for our spin engine. Um, for simplicity, I've chosen here harmonic driving protocols. This is just a circle in the parameter space. The Hamiltonian is uh, the Hamiltonian of a superconducting qubit here, as an example, um, because it, it, it works quite, quite nicely. You see that... Um, the parameter V determines the level splitting and the epsilon is um, essentially a measure for, for the non-diagonal, well, the, the epsilon controls the non-diagonal part of the Hamiltonian. So if you, if you like, you can think about the epsilon as being determined by your rotation angle of the magnet in our sketch from above. Okay, uh, and now you, you basically fill these protocols and the Hamiltonian into your Lindplatt equation and you do a little bit of numerics and then you get the results that are shown in this plot. So um, the first one shows efficiency versus power and natural units. The black line um, is for 
um, the naive driving protocol. Uh, you basically take the protocols as they are given. And uh, the orange line is what you get if you optimize the driving speed. And as you see, I mean, um, in the region where you're relatively close to eta equals 1, this is the right bottom corner of the diagram, you come really close um, to the bound that we've derived before, which is indicated by the gray area above. And that is, of course, the regime of, of slow driving. And on the right-hand side, you see the time derivative of the optimal speed function, uh, and you see it's really not trivial. Also, the black line is the um, the, I mean, the naive driving speed, which is just, yeah, you go through the, through the curve at constant speed, and if you optimize it, you get this two-peak structure. The second bound, what you see here is in the right lower corner, um, the thermodynamic length, um, together with the bound. Again, the bound is indicated by the gray area, and the, the actual result of the calculation is the orange curve. Um, as you as a function here of the the coherence parameter epsilon, which as I said corresponds to um, the rotation angle of, of your magnet, if you like, and you see if it's zero, then um, the bound is identical to the actual value. That's the semi-classical limit. Um, and now the same picture holds for the optimal efficiency, which is shown in the left plot on the lower panel. I see nicely that the optimal efficiency is maximal um, if epsilon is zero, so if you're the quasi-classical limit, if you increase epsilon, you get coherence, you also get dissipation through that, that means your optimal efficiency goes down. Okay, um, so I guess now it's time for a summary, and I don't want to say too much anymore, I just want to... Um, uh, show these figures and these equations, um, which I think are the summarize the, the main points of this talk quite well. So I've tried to explain a little bit um, the, the notion of microscopic heat engines um, and why we are looking at these systems. And I've also tried to give a very brief and certainly incomplete uh, overview of the current experimental developments. Um, then I have introduced this geometric picture uh, for, from, uh, for microscopic heat engines um, for arbitrary driving protocols. Um, and here you have this nice correspondence between a thermodynamic picture, which corresponds to the upper two diagrams on the right, where you have a control variable, the temperature, or the control parameter V, uh, versus a system variable, so the, the effective pressure or the von Neumann entropy. And the lower panel shows the corresponding geometric picture, which lives only in the parameter space. Um, and all the properties of the system have now gone either into the geometric vector potential, which determines the geometric work, or into um, the thermodynamic metric, which determines the thermodynamic length, which in turn is a measure for dissipation. And this picture is kind of the summarizes the, the basic idea of the approach. Yeah, and then you have these four equations below, which I think are the, the key results of this analysis. You have a trade-off relation between power and efficiency, um, which involves only geometric quantities. You have an optimization principle, which as I said essentially comes from free, it comes for free um, in this. Um, adiabatic approach, and you have, uh, if you add a dynamical model to describe the, the internal dynamics of the system in a quantitative manner, you can derive a lower bound um, on the thermodynamic length in terms of uh, coherent and semi-classical contributions, and this in turn gives you uh, an upper bound on the optimal efficiency, which shows that um, the performance of the engine is essentially always uh, reduced by, by coherence. That's a phenomenon that has been called quantum friction before. Okay, I guess that's that's all I wanted to say. Sorry if it was a bit lengthy. Uh, 
uh, thanks very much, Kay. That was a really fantastic and very nicely pedagogical talk. Um, the time was also perfect. Um, so, um, yeah, we had actually lots of questions already during the talk. Um, so I will just go through them one by one. But guys, of course, if you have any more questions, please feel free to ask them in the YouTube chat. Um, okay, so let's start with a question from our own Archak Pokiasta. Um, sorry, Archak, I know I mispronounced your name just there. Um, so Archak says... Uh, how is a time-dependent temperature defined? Uh, to my understanding, the notion of a temperature is usually connected to a Gibbs state. Uh, is, it defined, yes. is it defined by some instantaneous Gibbs state of the bath? And if so, yes. then what actually pre prevents a continuous temperature gradient in the classical case? Okay, uh, that's a very good point. So yes, of course, the temperature is an equilibrium notion. Um, and the thing that's in equilibrium here is the bath. So we, we imagine really a situation where we have a laser um, that shines on the surface of your colloidal particle, and this way you inject energy that heats up the local environment of, of your system, which is constantly in equilibrium. Um, that also means these temperature variations always have to be much slower than um, the relaxation time of the reservoir, because the reservoir has to be constantly in, in some local equilibrium at least. Uh, and there's no reason why you could not have that in the classical case, of course. And in reality, you also have it. Um, for example, if you think about diesel engine or, or whatever kind of, of modern device, temperature is usually a continuous function of time. You barely see um, really these explicitly separated strokes that you have um, in, in the th ideal thermodynamic model. Um, I just I put that into this definition of microscopic heat engines, which is indeed a bit inaccurate, um, because these microscopic systems, I think, at least from the from the principal thermodynamic perspective, not from the perspective of an engineer, force us more to think about this problem. Yeah, because I mean, because for microscopic heat engine, you can always think about you have a hot phase, yeah, where you couple your system to your I don't know coal fire. And the cold phase where you couple it to the environment. But here, I mean, you really have a continuous heat source that you control externally. And it's much more natural, actually, to think about continuous temperature profile, in my opinion. But yes, there's no, no reason why you could not have that in, in a macroscopic case. OK, thanks very much. Yeah, that's clear. Um, OK, so next question is from Marcus Huber, um, who asks, let me start by saying that I think the geometry is beautiful uh, and the force trade-off is a cool relation. What I am puzzled about is the connection to an operational task. What would the machine do? And is there a connection between this operational task and the geometric work? Yeah, I mean, the, geo the geometric work is the, is the, I mean, the, 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 standard, uh, the standard work output. If you, think about, uh, if you think about this engine here again uh, with the two magnets, uh, the geometric work is really the work that you would get um, by moving these magnets, the mechanical work, if you just do it slow enough. Um, so you can, let me see if I find this a little bit earlier, this definition of, um, yeah, okay, it's, it's, it's not totally obvious here, but this is really just um, the standard definition of um, mechanical work. So this is the expectation value, if you like, of the time derivative of the Hamiltonian um, in the instantaneous equilibrium. And then you can rewrite it with a little bit of algebra in this geometric form, but it's really just the standard word. Um, the question what these microscopic heat engines actually do is more tricky, in my opinion, uh, because it's very hard to measure the work directly, of course. Yeah? Usually in these experiments, infer the work indirectly by measuring the state of the system and comparing it with some energy landscape. Um, but I am not aware, there might soon be experiments that make it possible to measure the work also calorimetrically. Um, but I am not aware of any experiments yet uh, where work is really measured um, directly in the sense that it goes into some battery. Or maybe you could see the, the schmidt kahler experiment, yeah, it's such an experiment where the work really goes in a separate degree of freedom and then you see these longitudinal oscillations as your output. 
Yeah, I was just going to kind of uh, uh, point that out. Um, that there, there is this flywheel experiment, right? Which, uh, full disclosure, I'm also an author on, so hence that's why I'm advertising it. But they they yes. did manage to have a, an explicit battery, and I think there's also a paper by um, by Van Horn and um, lots of other authors who I can't remember, which is in uh, MPJ Quantum Information that was just published, which was, is also a, a trapped ion experiment with a with a load. But but of course, you're right. This yes. is an issue in, in in this whole field about how to actually measure work output. Um, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Now, now that you say it, you're right. That there are there are some experiments now, but this is quite a recent development. Yeah, and in the in the early experiments, yeah, in the the Blickley experiment of the colloidal particle, the work went essentially it went into the light field, yeah, into the scattered photons, and you, there was no chance to measure it directly. But but nowadays that there are techniques. That's true. Yeah. Thanks. That's a really interesting answer. Yeah. So um. Okay. Let's move on um to a question from uh, Luca Mancino. Uh, who asks, does the metric have a clear role in determining how strict is the bound to the different thermodynamic quantities? Can you explore different metrics? Um, well, I mean, the, the metric is u unique, I think, uh, once you've written down the dynamics of the system. And once you have made sure that you go into one a unique periodic state, yeah? and then you do it a little bit faster than in quasi-adiabatic, and then you get this expression for the, the generalized forces, and that means the metric is unique, I think. Um, here in this formalism, uh, the metric is essentially is, is a given object that comes from the specifics of your system. Um, and it enters these bounds essentially just as a parameter through the thermodynamic length. And I've not talked about uh, an optimization of the actual control path. So, but I talked only about this, this optimization of the driving speed, which, as I said, is essentially trivial. Uh, if you want to optimize the control path, that's what, what Marty has talked about quite a bit. Uh, you have to solve the geodetic equations with respect to this metric, which is a much harder task. Um, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. No, I think that's a good answer. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so then uh, next question is from Ottavio Molitor, um, who says, "Great talk. Uh, using your model, is it possible to find the relevant time scale tau in which, uh, in order to estimate the parameter new that you presented before?" Um, not. I mean, not in this geometric formalism. No, I think. I mean, this is really a microscopic property. Um, of the system. Yeah, I mean, for example, I mean, if you think about the colloidal particle again, um, I mean, this is also, I should say, I mean, this, this slide that, that you're referring to, I think this one, um, this is just a vague estimate. I mean, I don't know if there's um, um, a rigorous way to define the tau. I mean, this is a, t a typical time scale, yeah? For example, yeah, for the colloidal particle, this would be the time scale on which the distribution function changes um, by an observable um, extent, which is essentially determined by the diffusion constant. Um, so, no, I don't think, uh, from the geometric from the geometric formalism, you cannot get this. You need a uh, concrete, uh, um, specific microscopic model for the, for the stochastic dynamics. Okay, thanks. But you, it's kind of a relaxation time. Is that how I should think of this tile? No, it's it's not. It's not really a relaxation time. It's the the, uh, the time on which the um, the system evolves. Okay, like, so it depends um, on the driving protocol as well as the relaxation time. Yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, this depends on. Yeah, but I mean, in in a sense, it, if you, I mean, I think it would be hard to write a rigorous definition for that. Uh, it's just it's just essentially it determines an order of magnitude, and that's all I needed to make this this estimation here. Um, for example, um, if you if you think about the, um, the 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 cupid, I mean, what is the or the the spin? What is the uh, intrinsic time scale um, of the spin? Well, I mean, it's determined by the Lamma precisions yeah, that you have in an external magnetic field. That would be an example. Uh, but you can have many of these positions in one thermodynamic cycle. So this is really the time uh, on which the system evolves. And uh, the, what is the logic here? The logic here is that, and that's what is also uh, the, the picture be, be behind this, the, the quantum friction bound that I was showing. 
if you change the, the system very slowly and the reservoir constantly dry, uh, tries to pull the system into a Gibbs state, the reservoir is constantly destroying um, the coherence. So you have no chance to see coherence between energy eigenstates in this picture. Um, that the system has to evolve fast enough internally to develop this coherence before it is destroyed with the interaction with the reservoir. This is kind of the, the logic behind that. Okay, thanks very much. Um, all right, so let's keep going through the questions. Um, lots of clapping and thanks, by the way, from other members of the audience. Just Thank you very much. Um, so, Hi. yeah. That was useful. Um, so the next question, I think, was from uh, Giovanni Spaventa, who uh, says, very interesting topic. Thank you for the talk. Uh, can the line integral of this thermodynamic vector potential in parameter space somehow be interpreted uh, as a Berry phase for that thermodynamic oh, process? Oh, yeah. you can. I didn't do that uh, here. Um, but, of course, um, this is the exactly the same mathematical structure, uh, structure that you get in the Berry formalism. You have this line integral, and now you can rewrite it um, as an area integral over the area that you encircle with gamma over the uh, rotation of the selector uh, potential that essentially would give you the effective Barry curvature here. So, yes, you can do that. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and then I think the next question is kind of on a, a similar vein. Um, so, from Fernando uh, Javier Gomez Ruiz. Um, for me, it's a very interesting topic, and I apologize if this question is very basic. Actually, Fernando, I had basically the same question, so it's, uh, it's a good question. Um, so he asks, maybe, is it possible to think about new interpretations for the geometric work uh, using the Green theorem? Mm. I am not sure if that gives you a new interpretation. I mean, I think the, the interpretation of this quantity, the, the, the geometric work is... is quite clear. Um, if you use the green theorem, I mean, you can rewrite it, as I said before, um, as an area integral over a rotation, and then you have yeah, this, this, this standard formalism. You can explicitly show that it is independent of the parameterization and so on. Uh, but it's just a rewriting. I mean, I think it doesn't really change much of the story. What you get is, I mean, a nice way if you uh, to to optimize to maximize the the geometric work, yeah. Now, if you think about the geometric work as an area integral over some um, ro rotation, which is just scalar in the two dimensional case, at the Berry curvature is just a scalar. You can plot this this Berry curvature landscape in a in a two dimensional setting, or yeah, as a three dimensional landscape over a two dimensional parameter plane, and then you can basically draw um, your circle. On this uh, this landscape, such that you get as much as possible um, of the of the of the area uh, of the of the Berry curvature into your uh, into your curve gamma, that would um, maximize your work W, your geometric work. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, the question that I had in relation to this is, um, and this is also maybe a stupid question, but I mean, if you if you look at the picture that you drew, I think it was on slide fifteen of, of this uh, kind of geometric picture. I uh, just just previous fifteen, I think it was. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. this is basically a divergenceless vector field that you've drawn there. I mean, do you think it would be possible to have some kind of divergence there? I mean, what I'm basically thinking of is some some kind of Aronoff Bohm type uh, thing, right? Where basically, if you have some singular point then actually the, the line integral becomes in, not just parameterization uh, invariant, but actually topologically invariant, right? So it becomes completely yes. independent of the path. And that's kind of interesting because then you have an extremely robust engine, right? It's, it's independent of how you move through the parameter space, the, the work that you get. But I don't know if that makes sense even to, to talk about this. Uh, yeah, it, um, it is, I mean, it's certainly something worth thinking about. Um, I... I haven't tried it, um, but um, one would—I mean, one would have to look into into the, the the conditions that have to be demanded from the system to get this kind of uh, of singular vector potential. I, I don't know if that can be produced. I mean, probably um, probably you can produce that um, in a sufficiently complex quantum system. I mean, cert certainly not with two-level systems and harmonic oscillators. 
Um, or at least I would be very surprised if that was possible. But um, but with complex systems, uh, I think that there has been there has been a paper. I forgot the authors, but there has been a paper about the topological quantization of thermodynamic work, and it might be worth looking into that. Um, but it's certainly an interesting point. Yes. Cool. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, so let's move on to the next question, uh, which is from um, Bavesh uh, Valetcha. So um, he says, Thank uh, "Hi, thanks a lot for the talk. Have you compared your bound with the one derived by Pietzonka and Seifert? Um, <laughs> uh, I was wondering if the quantum effects help go beyond the above mentioned bound." Um. Well, the pitonka seifert bound does not apply to periodic heat engines. Uh, this is a bound that, that follows directly from the thermodynamic uncertainty relation in its standard form. Um, and this relation is only valid for, for time homogeneous Markov processes, so you cannot apply it to periodically driven systems. But uh, there is a bit more recent work uh, by Udo Seifert and Timo Koyuk, um, where they write a somewhat similar relation for periodic systems and also um, a bound on um, the, the power of periodic heat engines, which is in the same spirit as the Pizonka Seifert bound because it depends on the accumulated quantities. Yeah? So the, um, here you have essentially, um, well, yeah. Accumulated quantity is the wrong word. It depends on fluctuations. It depends on fluctuations of um, of the generated work or the uh, or the, the um, absorbed heat, for example. Um, I am not quite sure if this can be related. Um, at least, as far as I know, there is no way, or well, at least it has not yet been done. Uh, to to extend this bound to the quantum regime, um, and I am really not not quite sure. I would be a bit pessimistic if um, that these bounds can be compared directly, because uh, I mean this is just the other a very qualitative argument. But I mean f fluctuations. Uh, second cumulants yeah, of generated work, for example, or of absorbed heat are very hard to get typically. And they, in one or the other way, always involve some, some sort of, of, uh, of non-Markovian expression, um, at least um, beyond linear response. And here you have everything in a, in a quite compact form, which essentially depends only on the instantaneous equilibrium states. So I'm not so sure if, if these things can be can be compared in a quantitative manner. At least I haven't tried. That's probably the short answer. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, all right, so I think this is probably the last question. If anyone has any more questions, feel free to ask. Um, but we've had lots of questions already, um, which is really great. So uh, Prasanna Venkatesh asks, uh, is there a clear physical interpretation for the U parameter in the generalized efficiency expression, i.e., when can one think of it as heat exchanged with the temperature varying bath? Yes. Okay. This is uh, this is indeed a good point. Um, so the yeah, I treat the U as an as an effective input here. Um, okay. So what should I say? It is um, if you if you have a two-temperature protocol, so the standard uh, classical thermodynamics um, engine protocol, uh, and you do everything quasi-statically, then the U is identical to the heat absorbed from the hot reservoir times the Carnot factor. So in the, if you like, it is the amount of energy that you pick up that you can possibly convert into work. Yeah, I mean, because uh, Carnot is the maximum efficiency, your input is the, is the heat from the hot reservoir, um, the product of these two is the maximum work that you can ever get. Um, and this is the interpretation, I think, that should be applied to the U. Uh, it is a bit of an abstract quantity, and I admit that it can be um, measured only if you're able to construct the state of the system because you need to have access to the von Neumann entropy. But I think it makes sense um, because 
that has, I mean, it, it nicely reproduces the standard result in the, in the quasi-static limit if you have two temperature protocols. Um, it vanishes if you have uh, no temperature variation in the environment, and it has this, um, this nice feature that you get a transparent um, upper bound on the generalized efficiency, and it comes directly from the second law with no other input. Um, yes, uh, I think that's, that's what I can say about the U. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I think um, after all those questions, probably time to conclude. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone for tuning in, and especially thanks for really great questions and your participation. It's really what helps um, make this seminar series so enjoyable for us. Um, and of course, um, especially thanks very much, uh, Kay, for a really nice pedagogical and, and interesting talk. Thank you very much.